Hello, and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Maha Nassar, non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace and an associate professor in the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Arizona. Today is March 6th, 2023, and I'm delighted to be here with Malek Afana and Risa Nagel. Malek and Risa are second year law students at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law and members of the Berkeley chapter of LSJP, Law Students for Justice in Palestine. Last fall, Berkeley's LSJP was thrust into the national spotlight after it and eight other student clubs at Berkeley Law voted to adopt a pro-BDS bylaw that pledged to quote, include a Palestine-centered and decolonial approach to holding club activities, unquote, by, and I quote again here, wholly boycotting, sanctioning, and divesting funds from institutions, organizations, companies, and any entity that participated in or is directly or indirectly complicit in the occupation of the Palestinian territories and or supports the actions of the apartheid state of Israel, unquote. The groups that adopted this bylaw further affirm their commitment, and I'll quote one more time here, to quote, protecting the safety and welfare of Palestinian students on campus, unquote, by pledging to quote, not invite speakers that have expressed and continue to hold views or host, sponsor, promote events and support of Zionism, the apartheid state of Israel and the occupation of Palestine, unquote. So those, that bylaw was passed early in the fall of 2022. Critics were quick to attack the student clubs, accusing them of discriminating against Jews. Perhaps the most outlandish attack was made by attorney Kenneth Marcus, a former Trump appointee to the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. Marcus falsely claimed that Berkeley was developing, quote, Jewish free zones, unquote, a lie that went viral over social media. As a result, LSJP students and their allies were subjected to vicious attacks last fall, both online and in person. We'll be talking more about that today. In December, the Tel Aviv-based International Legal Forum filed a complaint with the US Department of Education accusing Berkeley Law's administration of failing to protect Jewish students. And Berkeley Law is currently under investigation by the US Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights over allegations that the administration failed to adequately respond to the bylaw. So that's a bit of background for those of you who may have been following or maybe haven't been following. Today, I'm excited to speak with Melek and Risa since they've been at the heart of these unfolding events and can help clarify what's, what we've been hearing with regard to this bylaw, its intent and their reaction to it. So Malik, I wanna start with you. You drafted the bylaw that LSJP and eight other student groups at Berkeley Law adopted. Can you please tell us about the genesis of the bylaw? Why did you draft it? And how did it come to be adopted by these student clubs? Yes, of course. Thank you so much again to the Foundation for Middle East Peace and Professor Nasser for inviting us to speak today. Um, you know, I just want to start off by saying as people who attend Berkeley, Berkeley's had a long history of boycott and divestment. Um, in the 60s, the free speech movement really erupted at UC Berkeley because students demanded the right to support and fundraise for the civil rights movement in 1986 in response to what was going on in South Africa and the apartheid regime against black communities. Berkeley established a three-year plan to divest their holdings in South Africa. And then again, in 2006, Berkeley voted unanimously to divest holdings in nine major companies in Sudan um, to put an end to the genocide occurring in Darfur. So this has had a long history at Berkeley already. So this bylaw, to be quite honest, is nothing too new or too radical at Berkeley. A lot of students' justice for Palestinians at different institutions are often working on divestment campaigns. But the difference is, is they often go straight to student government um, and have a vote by student representatives. And sometimes that vote is successful. And if it is successful, though, presidents of colleges, administrations can have a big say in vetoing what happens. And then activism and organizing sort of dies down. And students are left wondering, what is next? 
And so having had this prior knowledge as someone that did organizing in college, I knew that at Berkeley, perhaps it was better to have an approach that was more bottoms up. It was using the, the voices and the opinions and the initiatives of students themselves instead of relying on institutional and I would say um, not disempowering mechanisms that aren't sometimes in the best interest of students. So the bylaw was started as a means to support divestment and find a way of how can we have students actively divest without necessarily needing to rely on the school or the approval of student government. And so this happened by, you know, ensuring that it was three parts, as you quoted before. One, very quickly, just um, ensuring that student funds would not be used to support occupations and institutions and entities that are uh, complicit, my bad, in the occupation of Palestinians, um, making sure that Zionist speakers would not be brought to events, and three, mandating a Palestine 101 training. And so I was able to reach out to a few orgs. We have around 110 student organizations at Berkeley. I definitely did not have capacity to reach out to all 110 at once. So I began with just a dozen. And so I wanted to make sure that we often talk about how do we practice solidarity? And sometimes we can struggle with practicing solidarity in a way that is theoretical, in a way that is in alignment with words and principles, but not actually with actions. And I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen, that this was a solidarity in practice. And there's a lot of students who maybe don't know about Palestine. They are not familiar with the word divestment. So we want to make sure that education is a political act. And so therefore, I wanted to make sure that by reaching out to a few select clubs, with the bylaw, that this would be an intentional coalition building process where we could really foster transformative community. And so I reached out to clubs. I said, hey, is this something that you would be interested in? And each club, according to their constitution, has a certain way of democratically adopting new bylaws. Some clubs, it's just a majority of the board. Some clubs, it's unanimous across all membership. Some clubs, it's two thirds membership. So each club has a different approach and they would go to their clubs. I would talk to them, answer any questions they had and then they would vote on it. So just to clarify that all nine student orgs at the beginning of the school year in August democratically adopted this bylaw. Also to clarify that I didn't reach out to all student orgs and of these nine student groups, these are all affinity groups. So you have a majority minority of students that are adopting this bylaw. So this bylaw is reflective of the majority of the people of color, of the BIPOC, of the Black, Brown, Indigenous folks that attend this institution and how they want to be able to support Palestine and the broader movement for liberation. Great. Thank you for that. And thank you for clarifying to the process because I think there's been a lot of um, misinformation or contradictory information. So you reached out to a select group of affinity groups by which you mean primarily groups that represent students of color, marginalized communities, etc. And it sounds like if you only reached out to a, few, a handful or a dozen and nine or eight or nine adopted, that means the majority of the ones you reached out to indeed voted to adopt this bylaw. Is that yeah. right? Yes, we had a very positive response when reaching out, which I'm very grateful for. Wonderful. Great. Uh, Risa, let me turn to you. So the clause that's probably received the most attention is the one pledging not to invite speakers who hold views in support of Zionism. So to remind our listeners, the bylaws opening line states clearly that it is adopting a, quote, Palestine-centered and decolonial approach to holding club activities, unquote. So can you help our listeners please understand what a Palestine-centered and decolonial approach to holding club activities looks like with regard to Zionism, according to LSJP, and how would that inform decisions about which speakers the clubs would invite? Yeah, so LSJP and Malak, the brainchild of this bylaw, um, really intentionally wanted to include the word Zionism in the bylaw because a, Palestin a Palestinian-centered and decolonial approach to Zionism is an understanding that Zionism is not a religion, it is not Judaism, but Zionism is a political project um, led largely by Israel, a right-wing controlled geopolitical nation state um, with the project to displace and erase Palestinians from their indigenous lands. 
And Zionism has been misleadingly cast as a right to safety for Jews. And I am an anti-Zionist Jew myself, and that's a story that's been told to me my whole life. Um, but that is not what Zionism is. I wholeheartedly believe in Jewish safety, but Zionism is has actually eroded Jewish safety in my view, and itself has promoted anti-Semitism. Um, because Zionism in practice looks like apartheid. It is apartheid, um, where the state of Israel prevents Palestinians from accessing water, electricity, food, medical care, employment, education, so many, so many basic needs um, in order to maintain what is, in effect, a Jewish supremacy state. That is, And it's all supported and funded by the U.S. and its military industrial complex. And so it's assumed that organizations at Berkeley don't host speakers that are actively promoting colonialism or apartheid. So the bylaws are just kind of codifying this. It's making explicit that Zionism is a political ideology of settler colonialism and organizations adopting the bylaws won't host speakers who are espousing those views. Great, thank you for that. So I wanna talk a little bit now about the reaction and the backlash that LSJP and others faced as a result of passing this bylaw. So many people outside the Berkeley campus, including myself, first heard about the bylaw because of the attacks against it. That included ad trucks that drove around campus accusing LSJP members and other student clubs of anti-Semitism. Now you're one of only two Palestinian LSJP members out of a group of about 70, and yet you've been subjected to some of the most vicious attacks. Can you please share with us some of what you've had to deal with over the last few months? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to note, like you said, that there's only two of us in LSJP. There's around four Palestinian students that attend Berkeley Law at an institution that has 900 plus students. So we're a very small minority to start off with. And we lack the representation that I do think is necessary when it comes to supporting the greater movement for liberation. I mean, the attacks against us have been I would say unprecedented for lack of a better word. Um, you know, it started off with many students being doxxed. And for those that do not know um, what doxing is, it's a malicious, really violent practice that involves gathering private, um, identifying information and releasing it online without that person's permission, usually in an attempt to harass, threaten, shame, um, have revenge. And so this was done to many uh, students, including myself, in which my own personal contact email was put out on Canary Mission, which is a database that collects information on pro-Palestinian and Palestinian students about their activism. Um, it was pinned on their website. It was pinned on their national Twitter account. I received very violent uh, emails, death threats, uh, threats to find out where I lived, things like that. And this is just my experience. And there's so many other students that were placed on this database as well, and that were doxxed. I think another important thing to note is that, you know, I want to say this is, um, as someone, I am the great granddaughter of a Palestinian freedom fighter, of someone who was detained and whose fingernails were plucked with pliers in prison. This is something that I hear this type of violence and this type of response that has ran for generations in my family that has resulted in their displacement. And when we see Palestinians on the ground, we see the ways they are physically and emotionally and threatened with their resources and their ability to live. I'm not comparing it to that, but I am saying that this is a parallel in some sorts at Berkeley Law. If there's only four Palestinians and we have the nation, we have some elected officials, we have representatives, school administrations coming for us, it is a means of trying to silence and censor us. For example, a lot of the clubs have funding that is backed by big law financial company firms. Some of those firms decided as a result of adopting the bylaw that they would pull funding. This funding is essential for a lot of these affinity groups to be able to afford to have retreats, to have networking possibilities. So they're really trying to pull at our ability to pursue our academic and our professional careers. We had a professor at Northwestern Law say that students that adopted the bylaw should no longer be considered for clerkships. So again, they're impacting our ability to form our careers, to make a will, uh, to have an economic ability to live and to provide for our families. Um, we have people as well, we had trucks, <laughs> which was probably the craziest thing that happened going around campus with student leaders names on it, saying that they were Berkeley Law's anti-Semitic class of 2023. And those would go around campus and around Berkeley and the Oakland area. And so I think that that 
response is ridiculous because you have students feeling unsafe. They are out of control. They're unable to feel like they know how their name is being portrayed. They're unable to know if they see a truck that's such a triggering thing for them and triggers um, a, a feeling of instability in them. We also recently in January had billboards all over uh, Berkeley, Oakland area that said, you don't need to go to law school to know that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And these billboards are everywhere. For myself personally, there's three, each a block within my apartment. Um, and so I see them anywhere I go. I take a walk, I go grocery shopping, I go to the law school. And this is a form of intimidation. It's a form to constantly say that, oh, we are watching and we're going to try to continue censoring you. So I just want to emphasize again, the last thing that this has caused a feeling of isolation and alienation for so many students. I would say for Palestinian students, it's already so difficult to attend an institution where our homelands, our families, the history of our communities is denied, where we don't know if people support our will to live on our homeland or not. And now with the bylaw and the backlash, we go and we attend an institution where we hear from administration and from outsiders that they do not support Palestinians' ability to even live and exist on the land, that they don't deny the apartheid and the displacement that has occurred. And this has resulted in a rift with students, which is unfortunate. We rely on each other for community. But now when I go to the law school, it's awkward. There's a lot of students that say, you know what? I need to separate myself from this and from you because this might affect my job. So in a way, they're trying to have this tactic to isolate us from our comrades and our peers um, because they know that we'd be stronger in numbers. So I think it, the level of backlash has been in all forms um, and it's been really, I think, just shocking to see how far outside agents and even within the institution are willing to go to silence us. Wow. I'm sorry to hear all of that you've had to go through. Um, that That is a lot. And to try to keep up with your studies and professional development in the meantime is just, it's a lot. Um, so Risa, I wanna turn to you. Um, Malik just mentioned the billboards around the Berkeley campus that try to equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. The argument that these student clubs are promoting anti-Semitism rests on the idea that Zionism and Jewish identity are essentially intertwined. You just identified as an anti-Zionist Jew. So I'm curious to know what it means to identify, what it means to you to identify as an anti-Zionist. And I'm also curious, where does this broader conflation of Zionism and Jewish identity on Berkeley's campus leave anti-Zionist Jews like yourself? Yeah, I definitely really reject the notion that Jewish identity and Zionism go hand in hand. And I think that oftentimes that itself is a bit of an anti-Semitic conflation. Um, my understanding of Zionism is, is that it was it is born out of a real fear and reality of immeasurable European anti-Semitism. And Zionism, of course, was fueled by the Holocaust. Um, and Ashkenazi Jews could not find safety in their homelands in Europe. Um, and in part because we are white and in part because European imperial powers wanted to get rid of, you know, the Jewish problem, Britain carved Israel out of their colony, Palestine. And so Israel has always been a settler, settler colonial state. Um, Jews went to Israel not to migrate, not to commune with Palestinians, but to control and displace Palestinians very intentionally. And this is all done with the support of white imperial powers um, who, again, are motivated themselves by anti-Semitism to get Jews out of Europe. So, yes, Zionism, I think, is born out of very intense Jewish trauma, um, and Zionism is fueled by intergenerational trauma and fear to this day of anti-Semitism, but Jewish trauma is not an excuse to traumatize other people. And I believe that our own trauma does not give Jews a right to control and forcefully occupy land that is not ours. Um, and often anti-Zionist Jews having this perspective means that we get left out of traditional Jewish spaces. And I think this is because of a concerted and ultimately, again, anti-Semitic effort to tie Jews to Israel. It's the exact same thing that Trump received so much backlash for when he insinuates that Jews have this allegiance to Israel. Um, Jews and Israel are not, are not, my Jewish identity is not tied up in Zionism. 
and understanding of what anti-Semitism is has been so corrupted that most people just think it is criticizing Israel. And that's not what anti-Semitism is. Um, that is speech criticizing a geopolitical state that it disingenuinely claims to act for Jews. Um, and actual anti-Semitism is important to understand and address, but it has been so clouded by this really perverse co-optation. Um, so to me, being anti-Zionist Jew is knowing that Jews deserve safety and security, but knowing that Palestinians deserve the exact same thing. And knowing that like I, my Jewish identity, I would never ever want it to be tied into oppressing and um, just hurting so many people. And so I believe Jewish liberation is tied to Palestinian liberation and the immediate everyday crisis on the ground for Palestinians just trying to do, survive demands Jewish attention and activism. Thank you for that. So just to remind our listeners, I am Maha Nassar, and I'm here with Mala Kafana and Risa Nagel, and we're talking about UC Berkeley's Law of Students for Justice in Palestine, or LSJP, as well as the BDS bylaw they passed, along with other student groups on Berkeley Law's campus, and the attacks that they've been facing as a result. So Malak, I want to turn back to you and do a little bit of a deeper dive. So the bylaw is about student clubs deciding which speakers to invite to their events. You mentioned at the, at the outset that they democratically adopted, those groups that adopted the bylaw, the nine student groups that adopted it, did so through a democratic fashion. Um, and at the same time, many media outlets have falsely portrayed the bylaw as an attempt to ban, I saw this word in the media a lot, to ban Zionist speakers. So I know this sounds like a basic question, but what is the difference between inviting speakers and banning speakers? And what is LSJP's stance on other student clubs, the 90 some other student clubs at Berkeley Law who haven't adopted the bylaw? What's LSJP's, LSJP's stance on them inviting Zionist speakers to their events? Yeah, of course. Um, I think that, you know, just starting off, um, we've had affinity groups that have had uh, clauses in their constitutions where they commit to not inviting speakers that are in support of white supremacy, that are in support of racism, in support of xenophobia. And this bylaw is no different than that. As someone who is a woman of color and is a part of the Women of Color Collective at Berkeley Law, we would never invite a KKK speaker. That would never happen. We would never invite someone that was a promoted ideologies of white supremacy. And so that's exactly what this bylaw is about. So this ban, this word and this attempt to sway and change the language of the bylaw, I find is very harmful because this is more about an intentional process of saying when we have events, how do we make sure that we are prioritizing the safety and the comfortability of all student voices on campus? That's at the core of every principle of restorative justice and survivorship is ensuring that people feel safe in a space and that we're bringing speakers that reflect the human rights principles we are taught daily at Berkeley Law. And so this looks like clubs when they think of having an event, they look for speakers and they make sure, make sure that they're doing their deep research into their background. What are the ideologies that they've promoted? What are the institutions that they work for? Where is their funding coming from? It's making sure that we're doing the due diligence to bring speakers that are there to create the change that we all wanna be a part of. And so this doesn't mean that you would invite speakers and then ban them. It means that from the beginning, you would be looking for speakers that are intentional and in alignment with the principles um, of, of um, liberation and of justice that these clubs that adopted the bylaw believe in. And so a lot of clubs, what they've even done is they've gone the extra step of sending the bylaw to speakers and saying, hey, this is what we stand for. We stand for, um, we stand with the Palestinian people. We stand against white supremacy, against colonialism. Um, is this in agreement with you? If it is, we would love to have you as a speaker. If not, we completely understand your opinions and we are, we cannot bring you to speak at our event. So it's just very much a, an honor and an act of doing the due diligence that these clubs 
can have events that are safe for all. So very, I think, basic kind of concept that clubs are already doing, you know. Um, and then in terms of LSJP stance on clubs that haven't adopted the bylaw inviting Zionist speakers, as someone who is Palestinian, whose family has been displaced for years, who has faced violence, I stand very strongly against Zionism. Um, it is a form of settler colonialism and apartheid. Um, when we think about you know, apartheid in South Africa, or we think about the civil rights movement, a lot of times we find ourselves wondering, you know, how can these people be on this side of justice? And now we have to ask ourselves, what side do we stand for? So as a club, LSJP is very adamant about that. However, there have been clubs who perhaps have not adopted the bylaw, but they still want to make sure that they're in alignment with human rights principles and creating a safe space. And so they've asked us, they've asked us, excuse me, what do you think about this speaker? And we offer our honest opinion and it's up to them whether they wanna take it or not. Um, and we have had a lot of gray area where there's been clubs where they say, you know what? We do wanna vote on the bylaw. Um, we understand the speaker portion, but we feel like we need more information. We would love to do a little more workshopping with LSJP. We wanna learn more. We wanna coalition build. And that is where I think there's a lot of hope in this is that even if some clubs haven't adopted the bylaw, they've still been intentional about wanting to learn more about Palestine, about wanting to say, why is it in the bylaw we wouldn't bring a speaker like this? What are your reasons? So I think that that is where LSJP stands. Um, of course, as a Palestinian, I would hope no one would invite Zionist speakers to campus, but LSJP is not um, you know, engaged in the villainization or the demonization of clubs for not being ready to adopt the bylaw yet. That is our goal and we're working towards it, um, but that's where we stand. Great, thank you for that. So it sounds like the bylaws actually precipitated a lot of really interesting dialogue on campus around these kinds of issues and you know, students coming to you out of curiosity, well, what does this mean and what does this look like and why did you take this stance? which is really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting contrast to how this is being portrayed to those of us outside of the Berkeley campus, right? So as you all know, Berkeley Law's Dean, Erwin Chemerinsky, has said that clubs adopting this bylaw are on solid legal ground, but he thinks they go against the spirit of open dialogue that should take place on a university campus. I've seen this line of argument actually a lot this call for dialogue though assumes that A, this bylaw forecloses dialogue and you're saying that's, that's not the case at all. In fact, it opens up dialogue. But also B, this call for dialogue assumes that university campuses are somehow this neutral space in which all ideas are freely debated. But as Malak, you've just mentioned, a lot of students from marginalized backgrounds, particularly women of color, but not, not only them, actually experience university campuses across the country and Berkeley campus as well as a hostile or at least an unfriendly place to be, particularly given all of the outside influences that come to bear on campus. And then more specifically in this case, the Dean who is the most powerful figure at Berkeley Law is not a neutral arbiter. So not only is he saying that this sort of open dialogue ought to take place, but he's himself has taken a stand with regard to the bylaw. He's declared himself a Zionist who personally opposes the bylaw and stated in, in response to the response to the bylaw that he believes, and I'm quoting him here, condemning the state of Israel is a form of anti-Semitism, quote unquote. So when the dean so clearly and adamantly takes a position in favor of one side and against another in the midst of this dialogue that's happening on campus, then it seems clear to me at least that the Berkeley campus is not a neutral space where free and open dialogue is taking place. So Risa, I wanna ask you, I'm curious how you think about this irony or perhaps this double standard of on the one hand, these demands that you somehow invite Zionist speakers to your clubs in the name of open dialogue. And then on the other hand, the reality that many students experience campus as a hostile space uh, non-Zionist, anti-Zionist speakers don't necessarily get the same platform or the same airing or the same support as pro-Zionist speakers might on campus. So my question is, do you feel supported or protected by Berkeley Law, given all the attacks you've had to deal with and the administration's public stance? 
Yeah, I would say Berkeley Law has not been very supportive of students who have been harassed um, by Zionists, and the administration has made it clear that it's supportive of Zionism. Professors have pulled out of groups that have passed the bylaws. Again, funding has been disrupted externally because of the bylaws, and again, our, our dean has been really vocal in his support um, for Zionism. But I do, I do just want to clarify to you that the students that have been doxxed and actively harassed by the bylaw by the, about the bylaws have mostly all been students of color and affinity organizations of color who adopted the bylaws. So I, as a white Jew, have not faced this harassment, and the other Jews I know of have also not faced doxing in any capacity. And this absolutely tracks with the racism that is embedded in right wing Zionist groups, like most notably Canary Mission, who harass students of color for even minimal support of Palestine, while white students who are maybe even more outspoken advocates for Palestinian liberation do not receive much, if any, harassment. And I think that's really important to note because that's replaying on Berkeley's campus again and again. And second, I also want to address that some Jews on Berkeley's campus have um, spoken of feelings of being unwelcome um, in certain spaces and kind of almost have the opposite, say that Berkeley law is hostile because to Zionists, um, which again, I wanted to spell as a myth that the media has kind of been perpetuating. Um, I think that is, for some, it's a little bit hard to understand the difference between discomfort and hostility. Um, so it's okay. I think if Jews feel uncomfortable, if you're grappling with the fact that your Jewish identity is being weaponized to oppress Palestinians, that's an uncomfortable truth. But Jews on Berkeley's campus are not excluded from any spaces. And I personally feel comfortable being at Berkeley Law, and many of my Jewish friends do as well. Um, and finally, I do want to um, address the other part of your point of like, what is neutral or civil dialogue? Like, what does that have to offer? And what are the goals of this dialogue? Um, is it to better understand each other's points of view? Because anti-Zionists know what Zionism is, and Zionism is the norm it's impossible to not know about. So our the question is, are people with Zionist views going to listen to me when I speak about anti-Zionism? And I'm not sure about that. Um, a group of anti-Zionist Jews I organized with at Berkeley Law have been trying to get an op-ed published, for instance, um, that no one is interested in publishing, whereas the vocal Zionist Jews at Berkeley have many, many, many articles magnifying their point of view. Um, and I, I do not think it's Palestinians' job to justify their existence to Zionists over and over again, of course. Um, so I think when it comes to neutral dialogue, I, I struggle to understand what the purpose is. Um, I do also, on one sense, um, feel responsible for other Ashkenazi Jews. And so if Zionists do come to me genuinely wanting to listen to what I have to say, I welcome those conversations. And I do encourage other Ashkenazi Jews with the capacity to have those conversations because we do need to re-educate Jews on what Zionism is and what anti-Semitism anti is and what Jewish liberation looks like. But I think a lot of the times the call for this neutral dialogue, like you're pointing out, Professor Nassar, are disingenuous. And so it's important to recognize that, too. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, Risa. So I want to turn now to the future, sort of updating us to where we are at this point and then looking ahead. So the bulk of that kind of negative attention and the attacks that LSJP and other student groups received happened last fall, and it's been continuing over the last few months, though it seems to have dissipated somewhat. So I'm curious, Malek, what the fallout has been. How have other particularly affinity groups or social justice oriented groups, both on the Berkeley campus and beyond, how have they responded to the bylaw since it coming to public attention last fall? Yeah, I think that, you know, while we have received a lot of backlash, I think that the support that we've received is also really monumental to recognize. Um, you know, Palestinian scholar and activist Nura Arakat, she called the bylaw a canary in a coal mine and an example of an act of resistance that can be practiced by pro-Palestinian students at institutions across the country. I think that, you know, as a Palestinian for years, we know that Palestinians have engaged in the revolutionary practice of samud, of steadfastness, right? And, you know, Professor Lena Mary calls it a form of revolutionary becoming, where samud is like a line of flight in the face of violent colonial attempts to cement the indefinite positionality of Palestinians as the colonized and Israelis as their superior colonizer. And I think that this is what the bylaw has done. We have seen attempts where the bylaw stands as a way to tell administration, as a way to resist against colonial and white supremacist structures and say that we will stand with the Palestinian peoples in all aspects, physically, 
physically, emotionally, economically, academically, et cetera. And these student groups that have adopted the bylaw have practiced the mood, have been steadfast in the face of backlash. Not a single student group has repealed the bylaw, despite all the backlash that they have received and all the fear and all the pressures. In fact, there are now 22 student organizations at Berkeley Law that have adopted the bylaw. So they've grown almost triple in number. Also, the National Lawyers Guild, a national progressive public interest association, um, has also adopted the bylaw at all their chapters across the US. Um, we've received words of different SJPs at different law schools and undergrad campuses that have now begun the work of pushing for their clubs to adopt the bylaw. So this is a growing movement, and this is you know, due to the support and the encouragement and the steadfastness of these students to stand up despite the fear. And I think that this is in alignment with the greater Palestinian movement, where Palestinians have continued their existence is resistance. And that's how I feel about the bylaw at Berkeley. And I know that since it has expanded beyond that, I can see in years to come that this will continue to be adopted at different public interest organizations, different SJPs, different student groups. And to put it simply, the bylaw is here to stay. Here to stay. All right. So Risa, I want to take it back to the Berkeley campus. So a couple of weeks ago, Berkeley's undergraduate student senate indefinitely tabled a motion to adopt the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism. And a quick aside to our listeners, uh, our FMAP's Occupied Thoughts podcast has devoted several episodes explaining how the IHRA or IRA definition of anti-Semitism threatens free speech and especially pro-Palestine's free speech. And we'll link to some of those in the show notes. So Risa, how do you see the Senate vote? Do you see it as a sign along the lines of what Malik was saying, that the tide may be shifting and that there's a greater awareness about the ways in which anti-Semitism is being weaponized to silence pro-Palestine and anti-Zionist voices? Or where do you think, see things heading from here? I'm definitely hopeful. Um, I think ironically that how, at least on Berkeley Law's campus, and I think generally how extra the Zionists have been at, at Berkeley Law between the trucks and the billboards and just like seeing our peers' names being doxxed as anti-Semites in front of our campus. Student sentiment has swung away from the norm of unquestioning Israel. I think now student sentiment is way more likely to be engaging with Palestinian liberation in a real and substantive way that I think over the course of like how long I've been active in this issue has been very significant. Um, and because of the awesome activism of LSJP led by Malak, students are having these conversations. It's hard not to have these conversations when there's like this truck right in front of your campus or these billboards all around Berkeley um, and wondering why their friends' names are on the side of these trucks. And so I've seen conversation increase. I've seen support for Palestine liberation increase. And so I'm really, really hopeful. That's awesome. Do I of you have any final comments or thoughts? I think the only last thing I'll say is I love to end on a call to action. You know, I think that for anyone listening um, who is a part of a public interest organization or an SJP or whatever group and is interested in adopting the bylaw, that is definitely something we would love to see happen. I think I also want to acknowledge that we owe all our work and our tactics to Palestinians on the ground. I mean, 2022 was the deadliest year for Palestinians. And in 2023, we've had more martyrs than we had had days, you know. And so I think that this bylaw is really key in supporting the movement and supporting Palestinian livelihood. And we hope that, you know, people are able to adopt this in their local communities and even expand it to adjust to their community's needs as well. Great. And so on that final note, uh, thank you so much, Malik and Risa, for sharing your time and analysis today. And thank you to our listeners for tuning into this episode of Occupied Thoughts. Please make sure to check out FMEP's website, www.fmep.org, for resources related to this podcast and lots of other great content related to Palestine and Israel. And please make sure you're subscribed to this podcast to stay up to date. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. And you can also watch a video version of our podcasts, including this one on YouTube. And with that, I am Mahana Sar, signing off until the next episode of FMAP's Occupied Thoughts. <laughs>